let's just start with uh, what do we want to know from doing our transects? Well, the whole idea is to measure abundance. But th these, this is a confusing word because there's actually two words we use frequently with butterflies, and that's occurrence and also abundance. So what's the difference between these two words? Well, occurrence is what we would call a casual record. So that's something where you might put it on iRecord. Uh, you see something in your garden, you record it, you put it on iRecord. That goes into something called the butterflies of the new millennium, which helps us to find out where species actually occur, hence the word occurrence. While well, abundance is something very different and somewhat more difficult to measure. So abundance is how many of a species are there occurring in, in a particular year, in a particular location. And the map shows uh, the locations in the UK of all our um, transect sites, because that's what we need to measure abundance. We need, we need to do a transect. Now, the reason I'm going back to basics is I know there's quite a few new transect walkers joining us tonight. So I just take it back to basics. Apologize to all you old hands, because this is a repeat slide from previous years. And I need to mention how we measure abundance. We use what's known as the Pollard walk, uh, which is a five meter strip that we basically count every butterfly within that strip, within certain very strict parameters, which are always worth repeating. So the temperature has to be at least 14 degrees centigrade, 13 degrees centigrade if you push it in the first month, April. And it has to be sunny. That is critical. And when I say sunny, I mean more, we need to have more than five minutes, uh, uh, more than a flash of sun every five minutes to ensure that we actually have flying butterflies. The importance of that is we know if, if you meet those conditions, then whoever walks that area, walks that uh, uh, fixed route, will see approximately the same number of butterflies. In other words, the data is reproducible. Therefore, it's science. Therefore, it's extremely valuable. Now, just as evidence that this actually works is I have on occasion actually preceded or walked behind other walkers, usually as a mistake because we, we've duplicated our effort, but I've had the chance to actually put the figures together from my walk compared with another walker, and the, the similarity is quite stunning. It's within two or three butterflies on, on any particular species, which is, I find, a remarkable achievement. And that's what makes our data so valuable in terms of climate change, in terms of studying butterflies, invertebrates in particular. So on the map, what you see is 2000 UK BMS transects, which cover the whole of the UK. You see the preponderance in the south, uh, we've now got a lot more in the north than you see there. This is an old map from 2019. Uh, it's a lot better than what you see there. Um, so the, the blue dots are traditional transects and the red dots are wider, wider countryside um, transects. Now they're slightly different in terms of uh, the route is fixed from year to year. Uh, but you only need to do it twice in a year. And it's in a given square. So, and it follows the same plan as the BTO, the British um, um, Trust for Ornithology. Uh, and we share each other's walkers. So during the summer, when BTO walkers aren't counting birds, they count butterflies. So it um, um, allows us to double our effort uh, and allows us to cover a lot bigger area. The reason we want to cover a bigger area is that many of our transects are in nature reserves. Well, what we really also need to know is what's going out in the wider countryside, hence the two schemes that complement each other. So where does that data go to? 
it goes to some pretty prestigious um, publications. The most probably influential is the UK Biodiversity Indicators. That comes out every year, published by DEFRA. And is, it is the authoritative document that's done every year as part of the 25 year plan, which you might have heard of. Uh, so this, the idea of the 25 year plan comes from uh, Professor Lawton, who uh, basically said that we, what we need to do is to ensure however, whatever we do to, uh, to conserve our species, we must at least leave them in a better state in, for the next generation. So the idea is to stop the decline in a 25 year period. And we're already five years into that period. And I have to be honest and say this, we're not, we're not achieving much yet, uh, but hopefully we will. The latest publication, the next one along, is the State of UK Butterflies 2022. And you might just have seen this document. It's a big and hefty document, which is not, I'm afraid to say, not very readable. It's very scientific. Uh, and if there's anything I can do this evening to succeed in my mission is to turn what that report says into something which is focused on Yorkshire. Uh, hence my 30 year of review. Now it's never been done before just for Yorkshire. Um, so this is gonna be original piece of work. There's also the State of Nature, which is a very general uh, publication, uh, which was done back in 2019. Um, and there's a new one coming out very soon uh, on a five yearly basis. So let's see what we've achieved in 2023. So we've walked 86 UK BMS sites this year. So that's an increase of 23. We've lost five, however, but gained 23. Uh, there's 13 WCBS squares walked by our walkers. There'll be a heck of a lot more walked by BTO, BTO surveyors, which I don't get to hear about. And we don't have access to that data in terms of Yorkshire, it goes to head office. Here's an interesting fact, which I hadn't realized before. How many years worth of data? So this is years of, so if one transect is walked for one year, that's one year's worth of data. We have 1150 years of data sitting in our database for Yorkshire. And that covers over 120 sites. So you can see on average, we're getting near 10 years data for each of our sites, which is a good achievement. We can now begin to look at trends. So at the moment we have nearly 200 walkers. That's up considerably from last year. I think we were about 170 last year. Uh, 1300 transect walks this year. That's up from 1000 last year and 3000 kilometers walked which is up about another 500 kilometers compared with last year. And another 500 hours of, of work you've put in unpaid it is our biggest contribution that Yorkshire makes um, to, to headquarters is what uh, the work that we do. It's a considerable, and uh, it's very important that I, I thank you all for that. And the amount of commitment that it takes to do that amount of work. We're also making good progress towards our 2025 target, which I originally set for 100 transects. I revised that up this year to 140 transects, because uh, I think we can do it. And we're gonna reach the 100 transects probably this year. So that's the third year uh, since I've been doing this. So I think we can up, up the, um, the, uh, uh, the target somewhat. And of course, the important thing of what we do is the quality of the work that we do. So you'll see here how we progressed through years, how many more walks are being done at a high quality. Now, this is important because there's a good deal of variation between all of us in the quality of uh, our walk. Now, some people, I understand, your volunteers, you, it's just impossible to do more than what you're doing, fully understand. But the important thing that we need to know is 
in order for us to get an index for a species, we need to cover its uh, flight period thoroughly. And to get an index for the whole site, we need to do at least 15, preferably 20 walks. And not to have a gap of more than one week is the critical one to do. Now, some of our transects are single species transects. So they only cover the flight period of that particular species. Uh, but even so, we are looking better all the time. So in terms of our achievement this year, it's we're now get, getting near 60 transects with high quality data. In other words, over 15 walks in the year and a very high proportion uh, getting near 40. This is not up to date, it hasn't got the latest figures in. I think that's now reached 40. And that is a tremendous effort and a, a huge uh, feather in everybody's um, hat for what's, what we've achieved. Thank you very much. So where are we doing all this? So here we have the 2020 uh, map of where all the locations are and the 2022 map here, but it's also got the 2023 new locations in purple, just to show what's going on. Now, if you remember this map from last year, the yellow shady areas are the areas where, where we had poor cover originally back in 2020, when we had about 50, 50 or so active transects. Uh, and we, we can see that there are large areas of the Holderness, in particular the Wolds, which are very rich in butterfly sites, the Howardian Hills, the top of the Moors, the Vale of Mowbray, Swaledale, Wensleydale, Nidderdale, the Air Valley and the Calder Valley, the Dern Valley, Sheffield, etc. So how are we doing? Well, we are getting significantly better. So you'll see sites on the walls have appeared. Uh, we have new, a new, new transect in uh, Hull. Um, we've had new transects up on the North York Moors, uh, more transects on the Tabular Hills. More importantly, this strip that runs basically the, the same route as the A1 is the butterfly capital of the county, which is the Limestone Ridge. And there are so many butterflies, good butterfly sites on that ridge of limestone. We are improving. You'll see the new sites in purple. Uh, we've now got some in the Vale of Mowbray, uh, one in Nidder, Nidderdale, uh, more along the limestone ridge, a couple more uh, down in the Durham Valley, uh, Rotherham, and in the middle of Sheffield, uh, and more along the Air Valley, which is excellent news. I hope some of those people are with us tonight. Uh, they're very much our learners uh, and I would like to include them tonight if possible. Let's move on. This is a daunting looking uh, table. I hope you can see it all. Um, if you find that there's people's faces all over it, you can just go to speaker view and that will reduce what you can see to just my ugly self. Um, but basically what it is, is it's looking at all our, well, it's looking at a selection uh, of our um, of our transects, the ones which are frequently walked and uh, report their data in on UKBS. So there's a few missing because they report their data uh, a bit late, uh, but it gives you a good overview of how, where are, where do the species actually occur in different transects? And it's in an alphabetical order along the top. So you might be able to pick out your particular transect if you're lucky. Uh, if you're in W like uh, Catherine, you might be covered up by yourself, but you're the last, last column. Um, but what it's showing you is the, the, the top two, the highest counts for each species across all our transects. The reason I show this is it's interesting because it is just scattered all over. 
So almost every transect has one species, which is in the top two, which I find staggering, really, that we've managed to get a really good cover of all our species. So you got, you're going to ask the question, I know everybody's going to ask the question, which, which transect has the highest index? And the highest index is firmly with the forest of flowers. It's living up to its name. Uh, I think there's various um, people who joined us from forest of flowers tonight. Uh, I think the owner and the one or two of the um, walkers are with us tonight. Um, and you can see some really high scores there. And it also has uh, one, two, three, four. It has six of the highest scores for, of sorry, six species reach their highest, highest scores in the forest of flowers. Next highest, probably is right next door to it, is Fodden, if I pronounce it right, or Forden, if you're from not from near uh, Scarborough, um, is also very high. Uh, with a very interesting list of species. Uh, Brocadel is also very high up there, uh, which you'll see uh, over here uh, with three species in the, in the, in the, in the top, uh, but there's many, many others. Um, places like Malum, Malum Tarn, which you wouldn't associate with, uh, with, uh, with butterflies, managed to achieve five species in, in the top, top two which is remarkable. Uh, interesting ones to point out, rare species would be things like uh, the wall, um, which is here. And you see that uh, Fodden and uh, Wycliffe, that's Catherine's transect, come out as the top two. Uh, things, new species, silver wash fertility, top two, Brocadale, and this right, Bishop Wood, which is my transect. Um, Duke of Burgundy on the Hornby Hill transect, very important. I think one of the, one or two of the walkers are here tonight. Um, Northern Brown Ar Argus. Uh, we have approximately five sites with Northern Brown Argus and two of them are exceptionally good sites. So Lee Green uh, and Low Ox. Uh, Lee Green is Bastow Wood, and then just around the corner is Low Ox on at Kilnsey. Um, Brown Argus, uh, Fodden Chalkbank takes the prize there with a huge number, 280 uh, Brown Argus. Um, yeah, hopefully you can see your, your, your uh, transect there. Um, I find it endlessly interesting that we have been criticized that what we do only only looks at uh, uh, at just nature reserves and gives a false impression of uh, species. I would argue against that because there's a, there's a lot of in here. You also find urban transects like uh, Meanwood Trail, um, which is very much in the heart of Leeds, um, and I think we actually have a, a much better overview because of the range of, uh, uh, of transects we now have. So let's move on now to the 2022 season. Uh, well, what can you say? It was an extreme one, a hummer of a summer, I've called it. Uh, I love the picture of the hummingbird hawk moth. You just can't beat them. And you might have noticed um, on our sightings page that uh, somebody has, has seen one uh, literally, uh, I think about, three days ago in Horsforth near Leeds. Um, it obviously just uh, come out of hibernation. The numbers last year were, were amazing for the hummingbird hawk moth. Matthew Oates made it his uh, butterfly of the year, even though it is a moth. Uh, it got promoted to be in a butterfly. Uh, and the simple reason is there were 10 times more than any other previous season, um, an amazing amazing fact. This is just the headline figures for uh, the season. Uh, it was extreme heat. We'll, we're never going to forget the uh, some of the temperatures. I think like like I did, 
we try and get our transects out out the way in the in the morning if we had to do one uh, on a hot day uh, you couldn't re it was seriously uh, dangerous to go walking after 11 o'clock and certainly I would strongly advise anybody when it gets above 30 not to walk your transect after 11 o'clock it was also a, a very good year for migrants but not migrant butterflies migrant moths and you might have saw, saw Charlie Fletcher's uh, moth roundup of the year. It was very much dominated. The headlines were dominated by huge numbers of new migrants appearing in the UK. It was a record year for migrants appearing. Of course, the big story, I think, with when you look at the figures will be the effect of drought. But also in there, one we haven't talked about before, and that's the effect of parasites. And some of them I have, have caused both booms and busts. And the first two here, the two biggest winner, Holly Blue, is all about uh, overcoming its parasite. And Small Tortoiseshell, a huge drop in numbers this year, is all about uh, uh, really is being badly affected by a parasite, but also the drought. But let's get on to now the weather. Thanks for Dave Ramson for these, these graphics. Um, and let's just, just add a bit of meat to the story here because weather, weather with butterflies is almost everything really. Um, they cannot raise it, they can only raise the temperature a little bit. They are dependent on the weather to, to, to warm themselves up to be able to fly. So to be able to reproduce, to be able to fly, you, you, you got to have warm weather. Hence the Pollard rules, you shouldn't walk uh, without sun and a temperature of at least 14. Those are the minimum requirements for flight. What you can see is, let's just go back to autumn 2021, um, because a lot of species, what happens, especially the overwintering species, uh, and autumn 2021 was very sun, sunny, very warm, lots of uh, nectar around. It was great for hibernating adults. And they were seen well into the autumn in quite large numbers. Um, so that meant that we had a good start for them. The other good news about the last autumn were, was November, when many of our species caterpillars, the other stage in which they hibernate, um, was dry. That's important because one of the main casualties for, for uh, our species is November weather. If it's very wet and very warm, it's deadly for caterpillars. The other thing is if the early December, if it goes cold pretty quickly, that stimulates them to go into hibernation and not come back out again, which helps obviously their survival. Um, winter, as you can see from up here was very, very mild. And I remember on the TV seeing lots of uh, news clips about birds beginning to nest in February. It was incredibly warm in, in February. Um, and that I think added quite a bit to the year. Um, spring in general was very warm. It's up 1.3 1, 1 degrees, but more importantly, um, March was extremely, sunny. It was also the start of the dry. Um, the east, east half of the county in particular, East Yorkshire, was very dry. As you can see here, overall it was just about average, but the eastern side of the county was very dry. Summer, I don't need to tell you, um, we had three heat waves. It was nearly two degrees hotter than the average. We peaked in mid-July, you remember the Big, big peak. It hit 40 degrees centigrade in the south of the county. Uh, summer rainfall was less than half the average. Uh, so not only do we have a dry spring, but we had a very dry summer. This quite rapidly limited plant growth and nectar supply. And I'm afraid a lot of the rest of the story of our butterflies is to do with those two things. Um, crucially, I think uh, just as we thought things couldn't get any any worse, 
um, we had some rain in July, which I think probably saved a lot of butterflies. It partly revived our grasslands, just as a lot of them were laying eggs. Uh, this only applies to uh, north of the, um, I would say, Doncaster. South of Doncaster, South of Yorkshire in particular, they never got this sun. And their, they, their lawns, etc., just stayed yellow. I know my lawn turned green quite miraculously after the rain. And it was only a very short spell of about one day. Uh, but we got quite intense rain and maybe a couple of inches fell. Uh, and that uh, revived things enough. Um, the heat wave returned in August, and then unfortunately the season just seemed to end abruptly because there was so little nectar. Um, and that is the other part of the story, really. It drove a lot of species to east of it to hibernate very early. Let's move on and actually see what happened. Now, you might remember last year where we started to introduce this method of looking at our data. So what you see here is the various species, half the species at least, the number of transects that are up and the number of transects which are down. And then we compare it against the five-year average. So we got some degree of, are we, you know, how does it compare? Uh, but we also look at the Yorkshire one-year trend, which is the next column here. So how did it compare with last year? So I'm not going to linger too long on this, um, but you can see that uh, brimstone in particular was up. Uh, the skippers held their ground. Uh, the whites, or particularly the large whites, suffered. Um, the orange tip was up. 23... 23 sites were up, so only 16 were down, even though we only saw 5% increase in numbers. Similarly, the brimstone, 20 up, 14 down. Um, and you can see how this, how this confirms our thinking about this number, uh, because every site is different. Uh, some go up, some go down, and there's lots of reasons, mostly to do with the site, but also a lot to do with what landscape they're in. So for example, this year, uh, the limestone sites on hills have suffered very badly with the drought. While in the Vale of York on clay water retaining soils, it's been much less noticeable. And you'll see it in the figures that if you look at your transect, you can, depending whether it's gone up or gone, gone down, will largely be determined by your soil type as much as anything else. Now, uh, the, um, sorry, I went too fast. We only have one site with the Duke and Burgundy. It was slightly down against the uh, five-year average, uh, but up compared with last year. It's holding its own, just. The big down story is uh, Green Hair Street down on five sites, uh, seem to have a very large decrease. I think that's related to the, to the drought. Um, and all the other Lucinids, the blue families, were almost universally down as well. However, there's one big exception here, and that's amongst the brown Argus. So the brown Argus, you know we have two different types of brown Argus. So we have the brown Argus li that lives on rock row sites, and the brown argus, which is very widespread, quite migratory, never stays very long in one place. Um, the cranesbill, um, the new newer form of brown argus, which li which feeds on cranesbill, uh, they were well up. I think they were up a factor of three or four, and they were seen all over the place, uh, which just shows the difference, even within one species, how plants make a difference. Common blue was a bit down, but of course the other big head, headline is holly blue. So in my predictions, and you, you might remember a few of, the, few of you, my predictions last year, um, and um, we said we, th we thought the holly blue was going to go up rapidly, simply because the second generation last year 
showed a significant increase from an absolute pits bottom in the spring. It was one of the worst times uh, for holly blue in recent times. And we'll look in more detail at that when we do the 30 year review. But the spring this year was almost a factor of 20 higher than the average, which is just amazing. Um, it's, it shrugged off its parasite. It's lost its parasite temporarily. The bad news is by the second generation, the parasite was back. Um, but even so, it managed to do um, nearly a fourfold, nearly a fivefold increase on last year and 52% up on the five year average. So that's been a real winner. Let's move on to the other species. I guess the other big story, uh, sad story really is, is small tortoise shell. It failed, almost failed to have a second generation apart from in the upper and the cooler areas of the counties after two years of booming when we'd never seen so many um, small tortoise shells uh, it went firmly bust and unfortunately it took peacock with it and both of them are at a very worrying low i really don't know what's going to happen in the next few weeks to both those species there are a few being seen but to be honest, and maybe uh, if Catherine's done her look at the uh, at the figures for what's been coming out, Catherine, can you tell us what what the scoreboard is yes. like? There's been five species seen so far, of which Brimstone we've had sixteen sightings. Yeah. Comma nine. Yeah. Small tortoiseshell four. Yeah. Peacock two. Yeah. And Red Admiral one. So mm, interesting. Well, quite a few commas, so that's really good, and a lot of brimstones. Yes. So a good start, really. 32 in total. Thank you. Thank yes, you, Catherine. Yeah. That's interesting. That would have ma exactly matched the kind of prediction in some ways, because comma uh, was exceptional this year. And that may be the reason why it scored. Uh, second highest in 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 our quick quick survey tonight. It's a hundred percent up on last year, twenty one percent up against the average. Um, and the summer generation was the so called Hutchinsoni generation. Uh, that's a generation which is able to reproduce. Because normally, normal commas uh, are not sexually mature when they when they uh, when they emerge in summer, and um, and they are the ones that uh, hibernate. But if they manage to achieve their life cycle before, uh, uh, basically become a pupa before Midsummer's Day, they hatch as the form Hutchinsoni. It's colored differently. So it's a, it's a much brighter golden, the spots are much smaller. It's a, just a different form and this year, Hutchinsoni was exceptional, uh, up by I think a factor of four or five compared with previous. Um, and that means that there was another generation. The big problem with both those species is uh, small tortoiseshell and peacock is they suffer with parasites. And we're just gonna talk about that. When I talk about tortoiseshell, I'm gonna show you a bit more detail about that. So good news about the comma, uh, the speckled wood. Now you would think in the heat for a species that likes, which is a grass feeder, it would really suffer in the drought. Well, it hasn't. It's absolutely boomed uh, up on up against the five year average and nearly 50% more than previous year. Uh, they really have had a good year. Wall. Now that's another story, which I'm gonna elaborate on in the 30 year review, has had yet another good, good year. More than 40% of our uh, monitored sites now have war. It's up about another eight sites this year. Um, they are on the move and there's a lot happening with war. Gatekeeper is boomed again. And you might remember when we got to August, there were very few butterflies apart from gatekeepers. 
they were the last last of the survivors in the heat and they really did boom um many of the other brands also boomed the marble white had a an amazing year um i wouldn't have believed if somebody said that i would get a marble white in my garden in the middle of farmland in a cereal prairie south of york i would say you're absolutely crazy well this year i had a marble white in my garden and many 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 other people had them too this year was also about dispersal there was a big preponderance of species dispersing in the heat that we had and i think this year had to rewrite most of the rule books about dispersal because it was happening over very big distances not just the odd few miles not just blown down off the walls it was happening wide scale in big numbers for a number of species but definitely the marble white let's move on okay i promised you a look back in time and this is very much in our tardis we're going to go back to 1990 just take a deep breath before you look at this and just look at first the blue line the blue line is the average mean maximum temperature in summer for each of those years from 1990 to 2022. And what you notice straight, of, straight away is there are various peaks along that line, the biggest peak being 2022, as you would imagine. It was exceptional. But there have been other peaks along the way, and some of them are quite close to the 2022 peak. The reason I'm interested in this measurement is it's all about uh, butterflies. So butterflies enjoy that warmest part of the day. That's when their, their life cycle is, is, is going on. Uh, they're not really uh, functioning during the winter, apart from hibernating. Uh, and summer, we know summer is a critical time for them. If we get a good summer, we get good numbers of butterflies. So you'll see the blue line and you'll see the peaks. And you might remember some of these years, certainly I do. 95, 95 in particular, very sunny uh, uh, year, very hot. Uh, the next one was 2003, but 2006 was also an exceptional year. Now then something interesting happens. 2013 and 2014 were both hot years. And then uh, 2018, 2019 were two hot years. When you get two hot years together, interesting things happen. And let me explain. The other lines you see here is the red dotted is Sun, sunshine hours and the green dotted is rainfall and you can see the drought of 95 was worse than the drought of 2022 and the sunshine of 95 was in excess excess of this year by a considerable margin it was our last really big cracking year and that's a year I think we will refer to. The only one that came anywhere near close this year and 2018 was very close. The interesting bit here is the purple line. So the purple line is the abundance of all species. So what I've done is added all the indexes of all species across all transects add them all together for each year and take the average and what you see is i've altered the scales so that they you you can see the detail and we're looking here the abundance index for a year so this is a total number of insects seen from 200 to 1300 insects so 200 is is down there and 1300 will be up here somewhere so this is the average 
obviously there's some big peaks because we've seen some 3,000, 4,000. There's also some which are very much lower. This is the average. And what you see is a dramatic effect of, of temperature, much bigger than you possibly would imagine. So a change of two degrees causes the abundance to drop from 800, say, down to 400. So for that small change, you have the abundance. It is quite dramatic and you see it following the seasons pretty exactly. When you get two years, two warm years together, it kind of amplifies the effect and it also delays the effect. So two warm years together really does um, uh, bring on a, a surge. And you see here in the 2018, 2019, both of them were good years. It is shifted towards the 2019. And you see here 2022, where it's really shot up again. It's not going to be anywhere near 2018, but we're going to get quite close. So the headlines of all this, which I think is the interesting bit of the work that we've done, is the mean temperature has gone up 0.7. The maximum, which you see here, has gone up 0.9. The rainfall in Yorkshire has gone up 27% in that 30-year uh, spell. Sunshine hours only slightly, but look, a butterfly abundance, 25% up. That's the headline. I know it doesn't match anything you read in the press. It surprised me. Uh, but if you read the, uh, the latest uh, state of UK butterflies, you will see that uh, in the, sorry, in the last, um, last few years, almost everywhere in the UK has seen an increase. Certainly in the last 20 years, uh, it's definitely been quite a strong increase. And if you go to Scotland, in other words, halfway between uh, you know, the big butterfly areas in the south, um, we're, we're kind of halfway between. And we, we live in an area also, which is the northern edge of so many species. And that edge is moving forever northwards. When that edge move, moves northwards, it's usually accompanied by a big surge in abundance. And when we look in more detail at this, we'll see some of this effect. So we're gonna look now at uh, another mind-blowing, bit of a mind-blowing um, graph. Um, it's similar in, in, in that red is, red is uh, negative, green is positive. And we look at the latest figures from the, uh, uh, from the whole of the UK, and we see what I've just been talking about, but expressed in terms of all the species. So out of the, I think, 26 species, only six species are actually going down. They're not always the ones you expect. So yes, we could expect the, the uh, habitat specialist, small pearl bordered, is suffering, is still going down, it is a serious issue. Um, small tortoiseshell going down very quickly, ringlet going down, gatekeeper going down, not ones you necessarily expect. But look how many are green. And some of them are having huge increases. The whites are doing well, the orange tips are doing well. Um, Brown Argus doing exceptionally well, the Holly Blue exceedingly well. Um, if we look at our trends, we see very similar trends. Where you'll see where it's green on one side, it's green on the other. And the numbers are not dramatically dissimilar, which proves the work that we do, and this is congratulations again to everybody tonight, is the work we do is good and it compares very well with the UK trend. Sometimes there are differences and those are the ones we need to concentrate on. Um, the hair streaks, now unfortunately we don't have a decent measurement of hair streaks. Uh, maybe I'll talk, if I have time, I'll talk about that a bit, bit later. But it's simply because we can't measure it with our system. Transects are very poor at measuring the purple and the white letter hair streak. 
and we don't have enough sites with green hair streak. Um, yeah, you see here, the wall brown, 500% up over the last six years is an interesting number. Scotch Argus, which has appeared, it may have been introduced to begin with, but now it's on the spread. So as I, as I was saying, Yorkshire is very much the northern limit. Um, so many of these species are still increasing in abundance as they move up through the county. And they're also increasing their occupancy. Remember I talked about abundance and occurrence being two separate things. Well, tonight I'm also going to include uh, occurrence in this over the last 30 years. And I think you'll be very interested to see some of that data. So our main driver for change, as you can imagine, uh, is, is climate. That's, that's a core one. Uh, and there's four times as many species increasing than decreasing here in New Yorkshire and in the rest of the UK. So I, get, I, I must admit, I get slightly perturbed when I see uh, always the headline figure, anything to do with butterfly conservation. The first headline you see from everybody is minus 82% loss since 1976. How many times have you heard that on the press? Well, yes, but it depends on how you measure it and when you measure it from. If you remember 1976, as well as I do, it was my last year in university and it was, the summer was a sweltering as we did our exams. It was absolutely sweltering. And it followed two previous years, which are very good. And unfortunately, when, when um, butterfly conservation do their figures, it's always compared with 1976, because that was also the start of the UK BMS scheme. Ask yourself whether that would be the right year to start. So I think you've got to bear these things in mind. That 82% also includes all the species, not only that have lost abundance, but also all the species that have lost occurrence. And there's lots of species that have increased in abundance, and, but decreased in occupancy because of the hostile environment they find out there in the modern world. You know, farming has become even more intense. intense. The other secondary driver in this, I think is a very important one, is nitrogen. And we're going to talk about a little bit more about that. It has positives and negatives. Now, nitrogen disposition. I don't know if you've been watching the news uh, from Holland. Um, Holland has introduced, because of some of the losses in its, um, because it's a highly agricultural um, um, countryside, as you may know, um, there's a new farmers party. And they are trying to persuade the government uh, not to introduce rules to, uh, to reduce nitrogen disposition, which have been responsible for a large number of the declines in their butterflies, but also many other species. Um, and the farming part lo looks like it's going to get a very considerable vote as the uh, backlash against conservationists who farm, the farming community sees, sees us as an enemy. Um, I've been a farmer for many years. Most of my career, I was a farmer. And I would say I'm a bit more on the side of the um, conservationist. Um, the important things to, to look here in the different species is the small skipper is showing a very long-term decline. Um, and that's important. The pearl board fertility is particularly worrying. Um, now, this year with a small tortoiseshell is declining because it has a new parasite, uh, which I'm just going to come to very shortly. It also hates dry, hot summers like 2022. It loves wet, warm ones like we had in 2020 and 2021. Both are large fertilities, the dark green and the silver wash both expanding very fast, almost exponential. They really, really are winners with, with climate change. The wall has changed. 
the war almost disappeared uh, from our lowlands. There was almost, well, it's very rare you ever saw one. They were around, just odd ones, but it's now staging a strong recovery. Marble White and Ringlet is expanding very high, uh, very high abundance. I want to new, look now, I'm getting near the end, you'll be glad to hear, just at some of these species, uh, the ones I picked out six species for us to just to have a look at the in detail what's been going on and you saw how abundance is very much determined by um by the weather and you'll see here this is the abundance for small skipper you see a big spike 2006 which we know is a particularly good year and then the other good two years was the 2013 2014 but then it stopped and um we didn't see the increase when we got to uh, 2018, 2019, our next two good years. And you can see the slope of the line is most definitely down. It's reached the point where in some of our sites, we are losing small skipper. Uh, some of the Yorkshire wildlife sites um, are getting down to ones and twos over a whole year, which is startling. My memory of the small skippers was it was always one of the most abundant of species. To match that, over here you see the last 30 years, 20 years of uh, occurrence. So this is from this is percentage, the percentage of Yorkshire that sees small skipper. So it's started at 24% is now currently at around about 16%. It's lost a lot. Now, normally we lose occupancy towards extinction. That's normally the case. So there must be quite a few places where it's going extinct, which is doubly worrying. Why could this be? What's happening? So I think this is where our nitrogen comes in. Nitrogen alters the habitat, particularly for a species like small skipper, which relies on the finer grasses. And nitrogen causes the coarser grasses to grow stronger and competes out the finer grasses. That is, I think, the combination of climate change with nitrogen is causing this difference add in the extra moisture. Obviously, that's also counter for finer grasses. Um, and basically, our soils are getting too rich for some of our species. Let's cho choose a different one, a very different story, brimstone. How far it's moved in very short time. Just look at the occupancy. We've gone from 10% to 20%. That's an increase of over 80% occupancy. But look at the abundance, how far that's increased. So that's up 400% over since 2008, approximately. It's one of the real big winners of climate change. And is because we're on the, the northern edge, it's not yet reached Scotland. It's into Durham, et cetera, but it's not really reached Scotland yet. And that's partly because the food plant is very rare. The buckthorn plant is a rare species, uh, but it is benefit, benefiting from when we plant buckthorns, which I'm, I know a lot of you have probably already done. Um, and I think it's also important to say how much our butterflies have changed if we look back to the 1980s. If you wind the clock back to 1982, if we were stood in York, for example, there would only be half the number of species that we have now. And of all the species we count on our transects, over half of them have only just appeared in, the, in that last 40 years of time. So there's been a big switch from the early 80s which was a turning point for our butterflies in many respects. Uh, the 75, 76 heat wave was followed by a, 
a very cold period. Um, we had an almost mini ice age from 77 to 1980 that really did hurt uh, butterflies. But since that point, it's almost been a, a, a steady rise with lumps and bumps as that you've seen in, my, in the graphs I've displayed. But it's been almost constant. So we now have, what, probably 24 wide scale species. Back in 1982, we had 12 or 13. Just shows you how much things have changed. Holly Blue. This is a little chap that causes all, all the problems. This is the Ick Newman fly um, that parasitizes the, the eggs. So you see it here searching in the summer for eggs laid by, by the Holly Blue, which are normally laid just on the flowers. Uh, and the larvae eats the flowers. Um, in a bad year, it's 99% mortality rate with holly blue. And you can see that mortality rate here on the graph. You won't see it on the currents, but you will see it in abundance. So you literally go 90%, 99% down, almost to zero, and then it bounces back, and then it goes down. And it's almost a rhythmical pattern that you see here, around about every three to four years. It's a big winner with, uh, with climate change, uh, up nearly, what, 500%. Um, and it is spreading uh, because we are near the leading edge again of holly blues. Um, they are one of the later arrivals. Uh, if you want to see them in profusion, um, cemeteries are the best places for, for holly blues because of the abundance of ivy and holly. Um, I was, I give, a, I give a, a, a walk in and a talk in York Cemetery and we see, we see more holly blues than we see meadow browns. Just shows how abundant the species has become. Now this is my favorite species, silver wash fritillary. Uh, it's, it's, it's spreading so quickly that the occupancy is exponential. The abundance is not so much, it's still going up very steeply. Um, we've got a dip this year because uh, my transect, we've had a lot of um, uh, work by Forestry Commission, mostly good work, but in the short term, it obviously destroys uh, a good deal of the violets as they widen rides and clear areas. I mean, the machines they use are very heavy. Um, but it's interesting to note how far it's moved. It's moved up the limestone ridge. So it basically it's, it's jumping from, from uh, ancient woodland to ancient woodland, which is there's a chain of them up the, the limestone ridge, but also uh, the tabular hills. So any, basically anywhere where, where there's gorges, limestone, uh, uh, ancient woodland, um, that's where it, it's really taken off. Uh, and this has all happened since 2017. It's a, rem a remarkable story when you look at the speed at which this is happening. The wall, I promised you a story on this. And you can just see here, when we go back 30 years, 1995, it was a common species. And even in year 2000 on the occupancy, uh, it was occupying nearly 30% of, of Yorkshire. As millennia approached, it just dropped like a snow stone, and then it recovered very slightly. Um, we did have a very, very bad win uh, uh, summer. 1998 was a very, very bad win summer, and then it recovered somewhat. Um, but then uh, some more bad summers, 2005, it just went down. And I remember you. You may remember 2007, 2008, the wet summers. Remember the floods that we had midsummer. Um, I've never seen it quite as wet in a uh, summer as 2007. And it just, that was it. That was the turning point. Uh, those two summers basically were the death knell. Uh, there's been some brief reappearances. It's, we knew it was still around. Um, and it was basically, it survived on the hills and the coast. So places like Fodden, which is on the east coast, and 
on, on the upper end, up above 300 meters or so, 200 meters, it's also doing quite well on very infertile soils, limestone usually. Um, and then something interesting happened. 2016, things began to turn around. So I've blown this bit up here, which is the 2016 onwards section, and just made the scale so it's easier to see. And the increase is quite dramatic. Um, it is on a very rapid rise, and that's reflected in your transects. So as I was telling you earlier, we've had, I think, another eight or nine transects suddenly have wall reappearing. They weren't there in the past, but they've reappeared in, in, in this last year. And the numbers in other locations have been increasing too. The last two years in particular, so 2021, 2022, it's been most noticeable. Will it continue? I think it probably will. Uh, if they can treble in just those few, few years, I think they're on an upward trend. So what caused the decline and what's causing the increase is an interesting thing to think about. And I think a lot of people talk about the, um, the suicide generation because as it got warmer, it wanted to produce a third generation, but it, the caterpillar has to reach its third instar before it can hibernate. So it can have a third generation, but if the caterpillars don't reach the right stage by the time that November period, it's death. Hence the suicide generation. And that was the thought based on some research which tended to show warmer areas suffered more than cooler areas towards the coast. But I don't think that's the complete story of the war. I think that it's very sensitive to nitrogen um, and that has got a lot to do with the decline. Um, but it's also adapting. It's genetically adapting, I think, to the changing circumstances. Some recent work in Sweden shows that it's been driven north by climate change. As it moves north, it's altering the time when it hibernates. So as it moves north, obviously it has to hibernate at an earlier time to cope with the changing seasons. And that's what's happened to a point where the race in the north, north of Sweden is now completely separate, genetically completely separate from the ones in the south. It's adapted, much like the brown argus, adapted by changing food plant. Uh, and many other species have changed genetically to cope with climate change. So it's not all bad news, climate change. Species, it's, it's, it's an insect. It can adapt incredibly quickly. It has great ability re to reproduce. If it can find a just genetic way of, of changing, it's finding that opportunity. Let's move on. This is the sad story of the small tortoiseshell. And uh, this, is the, this is the new problem here. Can you see these little white threads hanging down from the pupae? This is from somebody who's bred a load of caterpillars. And unfortunately, he's been very disappointed because they're all parasit parasitized by a little bug called Sturmia bella. It's a fly about the same size as a, as a domestic uh, housefly uh, that arrived in 2020, 2002. And has subsequently spread through the whole country in a matter of about five or six years. And the variation in abundance because of the new parasite it gets over the parasite, the parasite then dies out and then it comes back. But the, 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 the peaks and the troughs are getting significantly bigger. But overall, the abundance of the species is increasing because of climate change. And particularly when we get warm, wet summers, as we talked about earlier. Overall, occupancy is also growing. So it's up 20%. So surprisingly, abundance up 19%, occupancy up a similar amount. That's not always the case. Go to the website. If you haven't already discovered that, this, then I do recommend you go and have a look. 
So these are the transect reports for each of your sites. This is something I do every year. So it's a, it's a massive job, uh, but I do enjoy doing it. Uh, let's just look, say, at my particular web, at my site. So this is Bishopwood, Parsher, England, uh, in Selby. Here you see the, the walkers, how long it takes us, the length, the route, uh, the sections, where those species happen in those sections, which is described here, which is often interesting to know, um, and a report on this season, which goes here. So gatekeeper speckled wood boom, small tortoiseshell peacock bust is the biggest story. And you see here the typical red green, this is compared with the five-year average. This is the five-year average, not for, for, uh, for itself, so this is how it's varying on the site. And what we talk about in here is how that variation compares with the Yorkshire uh, changes. And that is the critical bit for, from the point of view of Yorkshire wildlife is when we start to compare how a site changes with uh, the Yorkshire uh, average, you begin to pick out site effects. And that's really important to Yorkshire wildlife to know what's happening on that site. So what you see here is all your species. You've seen this before, red and green, uh, the ups and the downs, uh, they're quite considerable. Um, as you see on almost every site, go up and down all over the place. I won't bother to describe them here. Um, it's much more interesting to look at the, the overall picture. Overall, 7% uh, down, which I think probably is mostly down to the drought. So if you want to go and see any of that, that's where to go, go and look. Right, so I'm going to now start to introduce some of our sites, and I'm hoping some of you will uh, want to contribute. So I'd like to start, if you will allow me. Um, anything else, Catherine? Can I start on uh, the transects? Catherine? Yes, yes that's great. Yep. OK, yes. so I'd like to start with um, uh, Roach Lime Hills. Um, is, is, Rachel, is Rachel with us tonight? So Roach Hills, there we go. If you're not familiar with this, this is a Yorkshire Wild, was a Yorkshire Wildlife Trust. I think they've just sold, got, uh, they no longer look after it. Um, and uh, interesting uh, transect in that it has partly farmland, partly uh, takes in a, an old wood uh, and a beautiful area of calcareous uh, grassland, which has been heavily restored by Yorkshire Wildlife. They've done a quite good job. Um, it has all kinds of species. It's on the limestone ridge. It kipaks um, and shares all the species you would expect with the, with the limestone ridge, including the marble white uh, and a few dark green fertilities uh, come floating through. Um, and the results, uh, an interesting one. Uh, Rachel also walks another really interesting site. I don't have the uh, details here, which is Town Close Hills, that's just to the south of Kipax on the limestone ridge. It's a great big lump of chalk, uh, bare in places. So you get some really, really interesting uh, uh, bits of rock rose uh, and abundant kidney vetch in places. So quite an interesting site, has very good numbers of dark green fertilities, marble whites. If you Ooh. told me of this, hello? Am I on now? Hi! <laughs> Hello! Thank you. I'm sorry, Thank you, I've been trying to unmute the whole time. <laughs> okay. Well, it's nice that you could join us. Could you just go go back and correct me on everything I've said? Um, <laughs> so you were uh, doing a good job at describing it, really. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, Town Close Hills. I don't have a map for that. Um, what, what, in your opinion, what are the highlights of, of, of Town Close, Rachel? 
Um, I it was the first time I've I've gone round to Town Close Hills like on a regular basis, so I don't really know what I was comparing it with. Yes. Um, but there was so many marbled whites that was, um, it was really nice on the hillside. Um, it was absolutely covered in marbled whites on one of the weeks. Um, and I saw my first dark green fertility of the year at that site. Yes. Um, and there was purple hair streaks, so that was nice. Yep. I think there'll probably also be white letter hair streaks there as well, but um, it was. I saw one that could have been it, but I didn't get a close enough look to be able to tell between purple and white letter. Um, so it's it's had quite a nice variety of butterflies there. It's had everything I was kind of expecting. Good. Lovely. Okay. Your your route for Roach Hills. What 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 was the what were you trying to do with choosing your route for? For Roach Hills because it's such a, a wonderful variety that you've managed to capture from it's, the um, Yeah with Roach Hills uh, that's one I'm more familiar with because it's where I, I've i been walking for years and years <laughs> so um, I've, I've known from years before where I've seen particular butterflies so I wanted to try and make sure I included a nice selection of habitats. Um, I didn't see as many as I was expecting this year and in previous years I've seen dark green fertility and brown argus and uh, dingy skipper um, along those routes and I didn't see those this time okay um, but yeah I was trying to cover all the areas where because uh, it's a nice route there's um, parts which are a triple SI and then some are farmland and there's a bit of woodland in there as well it certainly is an interesting site Oh, you you must tell us how you do it, Rachel, because you're very much the uh, exception. Is you also monitor uh, grasshoppers and crickets, <laughs> and I think dragonflies and bees. Oh, it was um, so how, the grasshoppers. <laughs> how do you do it? Is the first question. How how do you monitor grasshoppers? Oh, the grasshoppers and the and the cricket so I have one of my favorite things so I thought while I was doing the butterfly walk I could do that as well because they can hear I listen to them rather than having to look for them so ah. I record the sound as I go because it would take me forever if I was trying to find them um, <laughs> individual okay. ones it would slow the transit down quite a bit so you do it purely by sound so it doesn't yeah. really interfere so much with you don't have to look for them so it's not interfering with your butterfly transect no, I, oh. I, I look for butterflies and I listen to grasshoppers. <laughs> <laughs> Using all your senses. That's amazing. <laughs> okay. And the bees, what do you do with those? I'm not sure if I've got bees on there. I've got, um, I had a few dragonflies and yeah. moths, I think, but bees are, I think, a bit too difficult for me to yeah, try and yeah. do them at the same time. Yeah, dragonflies I do or try to do. Um, yeah. Um, and day flying moths. A lot, I know a lot of people don't do day flying moths, so I wish they they would because I think we can learn a lot from them but the variety that you do Rachel is absolutely staggering what what you what you get out of your walk is amazing thank you for it thank you very much okay I'm going to move on if you don't mind yes that's fine okay thank you very much for your contribution Rachel went hillside Les are you there yes I'm uh, here yes and how are you feeling today? I know you're suffering with your health, but how are you doing? Um, unfortunately, I'm due for a hip replacement, so Went Hillside may have to um, be put to one side. I also do Brockadale as well, so if I do get something, I think Brockadale is a little more important. I think you're right, um, probably, overall. Um, it is a section of um, land that I own. Yes. And um, I decided that, yes, I could do a transect on it. The lower field uh, is mainly down to uh, rough vegetation, uh, grass, thistles, nettles, you name it. And the, um, the, there's a lot of nectar source. Yes. The beauty of it is, with it being a southwest facing hill, that it gets very warm and yes. if we have an easterly wind or a, let's say northeasterly wind um it circulates the air so i managed to get a transect in april 
when the, the national, well, the local temperature was something like about 12 degrees. And on the hillside, it was more like 20. Really? Gosh. So, yes. Except when you got to uh, number five across the footpath at the top. Yes. You yeah, hit the wind there. Is anything and yeah. there was nothing. <laughs> okay. This is on the limestone ridge, isn't it, uh, Les? Yes. Um, the limestone you're... is right at the top. The actual yeah. ground itself is actually um, uh, Newstead sandstone, which is the top of the coal measures. Okay. Um, but... It's got the obviously the limestone effect, and the pH tends to be sort of seven to seven point two. So we do have lots of limestone, uh, lime loving plants as well. And you have a wonderful array of species, don't you? Yes, we we've got a really good colony of marbled white, uh, and the um, where we're looking at now. The, um, I'm losing my mind here. Uh, we've got dark green fertility coming up. Uh, there's a report that uh, the gentleman from the 70s said that the hillside used to be covered in um, dark green fertility. Really? And over the last five, six, seven years, we've seen the odd one, then the odd two, then the odd four. And we know we're sort of getting eights, tens and twelves now. Uh, and of course, the silver wash has come through. And last yeah. year, not on a transect, but on a, a, a reconnaissance mission, we had 11 uh, silver wash fertility. So, yes, yeah. things are, are coming up. Yeah, we only have the one year's results so yes, far. We started so, it this year. So, we can't do many, we can't do many uh, comparisons just yet. Uh, thank you very much, Les. That gives us a great introduction. Uh, thank you. Hipper, Hipperly Beck, is Ian, is Ian still with us? This is a new route um, that Ian has made. His target is uh, small pearl bordered fertility, uh, which, as you can see from the figures, is, is definitely getting towards the threatened end. Uh, it's in serious decline. Uh, Hipperly Beck is in the Langdale Forest, uh, not far from Ian's home. Um, and it's a huge, huge transect. Uh, it's six kilometers and takes two hours to walk. It has to be one of our longest walks. Uh, the variety of species is equally spectacular, uh, covering obviously some very high counts of pearl bordered, uh, small pearl bordered, uh, 68 in one section. That has to be one of the highest concentrations in Yorkshire for small pearls that I didn't know about, that's for sure. Um, the war is present. Uh, silver wash comes through. Um, uh, dark green fertilities. It's, it's quite an exciting place. It's got the inevitable marbled white. Um, it's not so far away from the tabular hills, the chalk, um, but it is really a conifer forest. Uh, and this is the outlying, uh, the strips around the, the, the uh, fire breaks, et cetera, which are very good um, he, um, you know, kind of moorland heath, very suitable for small pearls, just like fen, fen bog up at the top of the North York moors is suitable, um, where you get the marsh violets grow uh, in, the, uh, in the moor. Ian's are obviously not with us, um, so we'll move on. So is uh, is Sarah? So um, Hornby Hill, uh, we have a new uh, walker for Hornby Hill. Um, Sarah, are you there? Oh hi, yes I am. Hi Sarah, I think hi. it's the first time we've spoken. Um, yeah, uh, good listening to everything tonight. Good. Um, okay, let's have a quick look at Hornby, shall we? So you get a bit more of a feel. Hornby is a very important site because it has our highest concentration of Duke of Burgundy butterflies, which, and Yorkshire stands out on its own. Um, there's nothing really much on the eastern side of England. Duke of Burgundy wise, 
um, you've got to go right down to the south to find them uh, or up into Cumbria. So this is very much a outpost. Um, it's well monitored by the transect and it's a crucial transect in the, in the index uh, for the whole country because uh, not many of the sites are covered by transects. So it's absolutely vital that it's covered. No pressure, Sarah, I know you knew, <laughs> um, but it is, uh, and Jordan was supposed to be here tonight. He, he's had to cry off due to other range, other, other problems. Um, he would like to be here. Uh, to, and, um, but basically it's, it's, a, it's a big, big lump of chalk, uh, just basically at the end of the Hawardian Hills um and uh um it's a zigzag route you can't see it here but it's a zigzag route around the uh, west facing side of the um of, of of the hill um it has prolific uh primroses amongst the boulders that is literally a ankle busting bit of an ankle potentially ankle busting uh, uh walk uh finding your way through paths uh, through through the boulder strewn areas, but it's perfect for producing the microclimate for primroses to grow. Um, and has always been one of the uh, the major sites for Duke and Burgundy. Uh, it also has some uh, dark green fertilities, mostly along the top where they patrol up and down the uh, top of the hill um, and dingy skippers. And in oh, oh, always where I found um, um, Duke of Burgundy is in the fast. They're always having a giant uh, punch up with uh, dingy skippers everywhere I've been. Um, they seem to just love sparring with one another. Um, I hope you managed to see the, um, the uh, Purple Emperors on David Attenborough last night. That was a grand sight to see the Purple Emperors in slow motion um, fighting. That was... Uh, fascinating to watch uh, and we've got so much to learn about our 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 butterfly species but yes um dukenbergers and dingy skippers basically headbutt each other i think after death so let's have a look at some of the graphs so um in general across all species we see uh, ever, uh this number of number is increasing uh, more so than probably the rest of Yorkshire so that's interesting war as we've talked about previously since 2015 is off up a, a very steep curve Duke and Burundi is is flat if not slightly down not dramatically down um, I know the previous walker Esme uh, who's retired Sarah is um, going to be helping um, after her, uh, Esme um she always commented that the, the site tends to suffer a bit with ingress of of, of uh um of uh, a bracken in particular um so that that might be a factor although it gets regular maintenance work uh from the conservation site conservation team go in have uh do do control the uh the bushes the surrounding bushes and the bracken give it a good whacking. And you're probably aware there's a lot of work going on this year in the surrounding area to Hornby. So as you go down onto the Arden Estate, Gowerdale, uh, around the corner, uh, a sunny bank in particular, that is the concentrated effort that's being made. So it's being fed from adults coming probably down from Hornby Hill uh, and they're beginning to spread as they are in, in the Pickering area, which is the second site um, in Newtondale, in the Pickering Woods. Uh, we're also doing a lot of work this year, this year, expanding the area suitable for Duke of Burgundy. So overall, the picture is up. I don't know if Steve, Steve Kirtley, are you, are you there, Steve? Can you give us any, any feedback on your thoughts on the Duke of Burgundy? Uh, yes, I'm here. Thank you, Steve. Um, I'll just put myself back on video as well. It'd be lovely to see you.
Yeah, there we go. Thanks, uh, Steve. Well, actually, um, we were on the Hornby Hill site today, uh, in fact, doing some uh, scrub clearance, uh, the last work party um, uh, of the year um, or, or of the uh, winter. Uh, Sam Newton was also there. I think he's in the call also. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, the, the, I think at uh, Hornby Hill, the butterfly is doing reasonably well, um, uh, as well as the transect. I do monitor it myself and uh, also been studying the um, caterpillars, uh, trying to sort of get an idea of how successful and where the important breeding areas for the butterfly are. So, yes. uh, but I think, um, you know, elsewhere on, on the other site, it, it's doing reasonably well. Uh, I think if we have a cool wet spring, then you know that does affect it. Uh, but uh, but yeah, the numbers are okay. That's reassuring. Thank you. Mm. Thanks for your contribution, Steve. No, thank you. Okay, um, we talked a little. We touched a little bit on um, urban sites and how they complement all these wonderful nature reserves that we keep mentioning, um, because a lot of butterfly sites are very small very special but there's you know that they they are in they're not representative of the of the whole of yorkshire and when we get an urban sites i think when we add that into the into into the mix we get a much more representative and i'd like to if somebody's re if emma from hull east park are you there emma and i'll just be briefly show you so this is a very big contrast, um, an urban transect compared with some of the nature reserves we've been looking at. So this is in the middle of East Park in Hull, uh, and it covers the, the animal education area. It's basically a circular route that covers a, a wide range of shady areas, some grassland, um, lots, of, lots of nectar supply, um, big trees, um, quite a short route. Uh, they get quite a variety of uh, but not not huge, but they get some. It shows you the, some of the contrast between our urban sites and uh, our nature reserves. Um, and I think there'll be a, an interesting one to follow. Uh, doesn't look like Emma's with us tonight. So we'll push on. So I'd like to go to Rodley. And is Howard around? Yeah. Hey. Hi, Nick. Yes. Thank you. Um, Rodley. Let me just find it. Down a bit. Down a bit. There it is. There okay. This is an interesting little site. Uh, um, Howard, can you just give us the lowdown on, on, on its origin? please uh, the, it's a, a former um yorkshire water tri water treatment plant yeah and it was landscaped by yorkshire water and handed over to rodley nature reserve which is purely a volunteer group um back in the late 90s and has been run by them ever since and uh, it's particularly good because it's quite a range of um habitat through from the the, the meadows some of which are natural, some of which are ploughed and reseeded. There's a, a coppice, there's some old deciduous trees, there's lagoon sides, there's the dragonfly pond area. Uh, there's a particular area of um, butterfly bank that's been specifically developed by one of the gentlemen there. So it's a nice variety of, um, of um, uh, species to see without having anything particularly spectacular mm. and this is your second year isn't it yes we've done two years now yes yeah so we can do we can do a quick we can do a uh we actually got some comparisons we can make i don't know if you've had a chance to, to glance at this uh, yeah there was no great surprises i don't think the um the the, the surprise really was 2022 we got a lot better start to the year than 21. yeah I think that's where we um, picked up most of our growth. I mean, we, as you see, we've gone up quite a lot there yeah. in one year, and it's all down to the first probably two months of twenty-two. Mm. Okay, and it's uh, it's uh, the soils are dry or moist. What would you say? 
The water, sorry? Well, your the soil. Well, this year it's very dry. Okay. Um, even some of the dragonfly ponds were drying out. So it was, uh, it, yes, it was a, a struggle for water this year. Okay. But um, yes, we, the um, everything from common blue, small coppers, um, right through to meadow browns, um, an awful lot of um, small whites. I do think the actual counts of small white understates the um, the actual abundance mm -hmm. because I walk alongside a, a meadow, yeah, and I only pick up obviously those within two meters of my side, yeah, and yet the the meadow has thousands of. Them. Yes, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, if there's something interesting in a place, they just concentrate on that 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 patch. I've seen it at Kipling Coats this year where they they in the late summer they replanted with. Uh, um, what do they call them? Uh, a mix, you know, for birds, etc. Overwintering birds. It includes, that's what they do at Rodley, yes. Yeah. yeah. And it, a, it, in, it includes various crucifers, and the small whites were just going crazy. Mm -hmm. um, and I've seen it in potato crops this year. Uh, wild radish uh, germinating in the in the in the maturing uh, potato crop, and the small whites were just going crazy. And they still managed to complete a generation on this little tiny, tiny two inch high plant. They, they still manage another generation. Um, yes. Amazing ability to, to recover. Um, if, if people want to know more about the 30 year review and each of the species, then you will find in the um, uh, transect reports, you will find uh, you'll find that graph, um, but you'll also see a lot of stuff which we've covered today here, uh, and also all the graphs I've been showing you. But it, it now includes all species, so I had to be obviously time limited. It's only a certain amount of time, uh, and I'm, I'm aware I can overload you with stuff. Um, but uh, it covers all species. Um, so if you want to explore that, I've, the reason I went and had a look at this is the small white is particularly interesting. From 2002 to 2012, it had a very, 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 very bad time. This great big peak probably is a migration. And in 2018, uh, both of them were cracking good years. I expect that was either migration or local breeding. And you're left wondering about this, this, this area here, which is you know, very poor. But maybe you wouldn't be surprised if I said the year neonicotinoid uh, pesticide was introduced wide scale on use on rape crops was, guess, 2002. The year it was banned, 2012. Boom. It's purely circumstantial evidence, but pretty good in my opinion. There's no real evidence to connect, but I think that is very strong uh, circumstantial evidence. You'll find all the, all the different species here, the parasites, uh, etc. So if you want to go and explore that, I also look at uh, the uh, the uh, um, the the flight curves in for different altitudes. Another very interesting thing when you move, like common blue, the reason it's become more abundant is on the lowlands it has two two broods, and the uplands it only has one brood, and you find that changes. So you see on the lowland, there's a little, little lump here, which corresponds with the lump of the upland. So that's a proportion of the species is doing one generation, but the vast majority are doing two. And as the weather changes from year to year, that percentage also changes. So there's lots of stuff there. I'm not gonna pursue it anymore um, and get back to my main job uh which is one more person 
Uh, is Ginny, is Ginny there? Ginny Derbyshire. Yes, I'm here. Hi, Ginny. Would you like to tell us a bit about your um, your uh, wider wider um, WCBS square this year and what you saw? Uh, yes, I um, I live in Harrogate, and um, I made a New Year's resolution last year that I would try and do a transect, but I thought. The wider countryside sounded more within my capabilities. Uh, and there was a square which includes two villages on the A61 between Harrogate and Ripon. One is Killing Hall and one is Ripley. And um, with Nick's help, I managed to... <laughs> create two walks uh, with a lot of blood, sweat and tears, I have to say, on the website. And the it was very interesting doing it because they are very different, even within that square. Ripley is quite a, a tourist village, really, and belongs to the estate of, I think it's the Ingleby family. And it's a very popular place for people to visit and there's a long walk out um, along Hollybank Lane which is basically um, goes through Bluebell Woods and I thought that one would be the most productive transect but actually it's it's very heavily wooded or bordered with large mature trees which shade out a lot of the light so actually that wasn't uh, as interesting as I thought it was going to be. It was mainly in the odd patches, whites and some speckled woods. And the second route that I had mapped out was from Killing Hall and that was basically agricultural land. Um, but that was, it was not so good in spring, but I was amazed because when I did the July walk, I was uh, very pleased to see lots and lots of um, ringlets and uh, meadow browns. So just very interesting from that point of view to see that your expectations aren't always um, fulfilled, as it were. I'm always surprised at what I find on my transect. Um, I must admit, my highlight this this year uh, came as a really massive surprise. Um, I was walking Bishop Wood, which is a, a wet woodland, and you know it's uh, very good for silver wash fertilities. But by the middle of August, they're just about all gone, uh, and I was walking it in the third week of. Uh, September. So I hadn't seen a silver wash artillery for nearly six weeks. And then uh, the weather being cold and uh, that particular morning it was warm and sunny and the commas had, had, had uh, come out and there was quite a few commas I was seeing. And then in amongst the orange there was something huge and it headed uh, straight for me. Um, and I have my um, I don't know if you can see this on the screen, but I have a I have a notebook which has been repaired with a bit of orange tape. Um, Day glow orange. It headed straight at me, landed on my notebook, and decided that I must be a, another silver wash fritillary, um, which unfortunately I wasn't. But it stayed for some some seconds. Uh, and then moved off, and I was left in complete surprise. Where the heck did it come from? So six weeks after, and the condition of it, well, normally once they get to, towards the end of their lives, they get so tattered and torn. Um, their, their, their wings are just stumps almost. Uh, but this one was like the middle of July. But I checked, you know, this, this was the middle of September. 
Um, so when I got home, I did some research and apparently uh, it has two relative species, the cardinal from uh, south southern Europe and the uh, great spangled fritillary from north North America, both diapause, but only the female. And what landed on my notebook was a female silver wash fritillary. It had hibernated in the mid to avoid the worst heat of this last summer, which I don't think has ever re been reported before. So that was my highlight um, of the year. Thank you very much, uh, uh, um, Ginny, for um, telling us all about your square. Uh, the last one I'd like to do is Fountains Abbey. What would you like to know? <laughs> uh, the range, I mean, the, the reason, it, the route that you chose, um, if indeed, was it you chose the route? No, it was the senior ranger. Uh, was that... it, was, it was to cover, uh, uh, that's Chris Wood. Okay, yes. Yeah, to, to take in as many of the different habitat types as we possibly could yeah. without, without ending up having to walk miles and miles. <laughs> yeah, so a circular route, yes. Yeah, circular route, taking in as many of the different habitat types as we could, which includes now they're managing the grassland just below the abbey in a more sensitive way. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're definitely noticing uh, more orchids coming up, more wildflowers coming up. So I, I think it, it was a little dis disappointing last year. I joined the team last year to do the transect. Um, yes. And it was a very, very slow start. But we are, I think we're, we're full of anticipation for this year and future years with, the, with the different management techniques. Good. We're on the limestone ridge again, aren't we, Jill? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Which is a recurring recurring theme um, through through some of these new walks, and just so everybody gets their bearings where where they are in fountains, where the S five is is I think slap on top of the of the abbey, uh, um, just there if my if I'm right. It is uh, yes. Uh, and some of the best grassland is section six, six between five and six. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, which is which is quite. A, 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 Calcareous, it's 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 moderately good calcareous grassland. Uh, yes, I, I say it's the management of it has has recently changed, so I think it's it's definitely something to watch going forward. We expect marble bites within a few weeks. That with, with I hope, a few, I, would, I would love to see them. It's one of my favorites. Absolutely, yeah, and and a few dark greens. But I think you've already got some. Let's have a look what we've got. Um, I think you've seen um, uh, silver washed, haven't you? I think it's been seen in in fountains from memory. I, I think, but I don't know if it was necessarily whilst we were doing the transects. Okay, because it's not it's, not showing up here. Yeah, it's not. And it's the second year, so we were able to do a comparison. Yeah. Um, but the 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 numbers are down ten percent, and the reason is uh, the whites largely. And of course, the poor old um, um, small tortoiseshell and its parasites and the heat. Yeah, thank you very much, Jill. And while we have you, Jill, uh, did, is is the um, the main reserve at Nosterfield? Is the did you manage to successfully walk it all this year? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't seen the results yet, but I'm. Hoping no, that... I think they're, they're in the pipeline, I gather. Emma, um, Emma, so... Emma's been, Emma tells me she's completely overrun with work. So she has um, begged forgiveness that uh, she will get to it when she gets to it. Yeah, but we, we definitely did uh, 2022 and we are already plotting 2023. And uh, the quarry it yeah. was also done last year. So uh, and I think we maybe even have, have another new site as well. So. Oh, really? So oh. Lot, lot, lots to look forward to, Nick. Indeed. Yeah. Okay, that's a good point now to just uh, mention because I'm going to I'm going to try and uh, finish very shortly uh, and just mention some of our our new walkers. Um, I think they're still with us. So. Um, Claire, uh, Claire Vint is going to uh, be walking um, 
we hope, Kipling Coates, uh, taking over from me, who I walked it last year. Um, but I've got too many, too many sites that I do. I did four last year. Um, and uh, I don't know if you're there, Claire. Are you there? Hello, yeah, I'm here. Hi, Claire. Are you looking, for are you looking forward to it? I am, definitely, yes. It's been really interesting this evening. Really, really Good. interesting. Thank okay. you. Um, thanks. And uh, we'll be meeting there shortly to redo the route. Is, uh, the, is, Sam, is Sam Newton around? Sam, would you like to tell us a bit about Garadale? What the plan is? Um, I'm still here, Nick. I, um, Holly Ramsden might be better to talk about it, maybe. If she's around, shall we ask her? Holly, are you, th are you there? Or Joe? Is Joe there? Yeah, I'm here. Uh, uh, on Jill's, though, because uh, we had a power cut. Long story. Um, but yeah, so uh, Gowardale, um, I've only recently taken it over, so I don't have the background knowledge of it but um it's like it's a mixed uh, site with a uh, forestry like coniferous woodland and then open scrub on the top bank um and has had uh well we've done a lot of work for duke of burgundy and um other species like that so um yeah it's it'll be interesting to see what we get however this map here is now out of date um, yeah we've I've, got, to, um, I've got your new route yes so um hopefully that will um improve the sightings that we get and uh, see how successful the uh, Duke management has been. Yeah. Um, yeah. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Uh, is Julie, Julie Hargreaves, Julianne, Julianne Hargreaves, is she, are you still there? Julie? Maybe she's gone. Well, she'll butt in if she's around. Hello. Ah, oh, there you are. Hello. Good evening. Everyone. Good evening, Julie. How how are you finding um, butterflies? Um. Well, I haven't done any transects, so I don't have any. I know. Doing transects and recording. Have you Have you I learned? Mean, to... This is a, a big learning curve for me, so I'm really okay. enjoying. Okay. Well, I hope this evening has been um, um, as as if give you some idea of what's happening in Yorkshire. Um, and we'd be very, very pleased to have something near near where you live in um, in Settle. Um, Skipton. Sorry, Skipton. I beg your pardon. Um, that'd be a really interesting, especially around where you live, is uh, a particularly interesting area. Look forward to f learning more about what you decide to do. Shall I? Can I move on to uh, Ricky? Ricky Bull. Are you around? Yes, I'm here. Ah, hello. Um, hi. Hi. Pleased to meet you and speak to you for the first time. Um, we've been talking about uh, restarting Walton. That's it. Yes, but but reciting the transects. Yes. Um, Let's go and have a look. It's one of one of the sites where we have a very long uh, record. Uh, which is what makes it such a, such valuable. So, having walked it myself, and Ricky, you you understand, I think, what I was talking about. Yeah. Since it started, it's changed a great deal, and uh, it is largely concentrated at this north end, where a lot of people walk dogs, etc. It's very, very heavily, heavily used, and it's changed a lot. A lot of the wildflowers and whatnot have scrubbed over. Um, there's been lots of tree planting, but um, there are areas like this great big area here. That's, uh, that's it. That's what I found because I've walked in that area and that's, that's much better, much less scrubbier, a scrubby yeah. Than those areas, and also the area, the S1 to S2, that's yeah. quite scrubbed over at the moment. It has. So I think, yeah, I think we need to think about incorporating the area that you're indicating. 
here, isn't it? Um, yeah. That was that was my favourite area. Just walking up this path here, mm. uh, I could see small. <laughs> It was, I was in a rush uh, and things were going past me at such a speed. I didn't quite identify everything, but it had an awful lot of small heath, which is an mm -hmm. endangered, endangered species. I think the small things which were buzzing past me too quick were dingy skippers. Right. Uh, but they were definitely, they're definitely small and black uh, or very dark gray. Uh, and I got a feeling they'll be dingies by, by the habitat there. Uh, but if you get dingies, you're going to get lots of other interesting species as well i wouldn't be at all surprised we don't see wall and other interesting things happening here i think it needs a redesign incorporate parts of the old transect so we can use the data which goes back to 1995 oh, gosh. 1995 mm. uh, and you can see during its history the numbers have declined that's not unusual for a brownfield this is an old walton colliery is an old colliery uh, part of it is being converted uh, as a green space, a country walk, which is this. Part of it hasn't. Part has been trying to maintain more natural. And that's where all the exciting stuff is in those more natural areas. Um, war was very common there. Really? Uh, Interesting. Who's, who's, who's ever seen 133 wars uh, wow. over the course of a year? There's not many places. Um, you see other interesting facts. I was telling you about how species have moved in. Here, you can actually see a spe species arrive. Like here, the speck of wood arrived mm -hmm. in, in 2001 out of the thin air. Nothing before. And then, woof, it's in two years, you've got large numbers. And this is repeated throughout Yorkshire. And it's not, it's not an introduction. This is completely natural. And isn't it just mirroring what we've seen with other species? And you can name a host of species which have done similar tricks all over Yorkshire in the last 40 years, whether it be orange tip, brimstone, all the, all the, all the hair streaks, all three of the hair streak species suddenly moved in. Um, I think it's interesting. Here you see the ringlet moving into the site. This mm. is the advantage of doing a 30 year look back as you begin to see where things arrived. So ringlet only arrived in 2001. So when was that, that um, sort of country park made out of the colliery site? Uh, as far as I know, a few years before um, our ex chairman of Yorkshire Butterflies, um, mm. Uh, took it on as his transect right. uh, back in in 95. I think it was the very late 80s, early 90s, as the collieries were uh, cleared and then slowly converted to yeah. other other uses. A fascinating site. Love mm. love to. I'm going to love uh, seeing you pick that back up and uh, uh, work with it. Okay, is um, RHS. Carlo Carr still with us? Is Gemma still around? If you are, unmute. Maybe she's not. Maybe she didn't make it. Make it. Okay. That is the, the uh, official bit over with and I'm going to refer back now because I haven't been following the uh, the chat um, and just pick up um, um, any other questions left over uh, Catherine anything left that I need to cover no I think that's it actually with all the chats being dealt with I think really excellent yeah. Right, I'm just going to finish with a, just a couple little points about uh, identification, and then I'm done. You'll be glad to hear. Um, and the species I really would like to, we covered last year, we covered the whites and the skippers. Uh, but one, one species that gets commonly confused is um, the, the holly blue. Um, I'll just pop this. Uh, here oh. we go. Ooh, ooh, there um, we go. There um, we go. Nick, somebody's raised a question about is there a new site in Hull? 
we're, we are hoping, uh, all being well, to restart the um, Priory Fields site, which is a long-term site, been running for nearly 20 years. We lost the, we lost the um, walker last year, but we're going to re hopefully restart it this year. So it, it's put on as a, as a new one, a, a, a new walker. So it's an old site restarting. I wish there were more sites in Hull. Um, right, Holly Blue. Very commonly confused with Common Blue. How do you tell them apart in 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 while you're walking? It's just another blue butterfly that whizzes past past you. You don't get much of a chance with Holly Blue. So you've got to use other clues to tell you what it is that you're seeing. Holly Blue. We, you always see them fluttering around trees and shrubs and hedges because it's it's only interested in the holly and the ivy. That's the first big one. If it's a common blue, it will be most definitely somewhere near Beardswood Trefil and in the open. Colorwise, you can't tell them. It's a little bit more silvery maybe than a, than a common blue uh, male, but not a lot. When it's landed and you actually see one, they very rarely open their wings, very rarely but it's much more silver and just a few black dots. You can also tell by the time of year. So they'll begin to emerge quite soon into April for the spring brood and then in late July into August uh, for the late brood. And last year we had three broods of holly blue. So they're quite capable of doing an extra brood. Is very much a insect for parks and gardens, particularly cemeteries, as I told you. Uh, it's not con not colonial. You only ever find them in very low numbers on your transect. If you get more than five or six in a year, you're lucky. Uh, some people I notice get nearly 20. That means there is quite a concentration of food plants somewhere nearby. So first, of, first and foremost, if it's near a shrub, it's most likely a holly blue. That's your golden rule. Common blue, we all know. But of course, don't forget the males and females are very different. And where the confusion normally happens is with uh, brown argus. The simple rule is chocolate. The wings are chocolate. And the lunules, so these orange bits, are bright orange, there is no white at all. With a common blue, there's always some white. And of course, there are traces of blue. Quite often with brown argus, you will see blue hairs, but never blue coloration on the, on the wings. If you're lucky to be see the underside, there are big differences. The brown argus, has no spot in the middle of its leading edge of its, while the common blue has a distinct additional spot halfway down between the last spot there and the body. There's an extra spot. And these two dots, which are far apart here, are very close together in a figure of eight on the brown argus. But it's just so chocolate and it is so orange. It's the main identifiers. Very easy to go on. Oh, sorry, we had a quick question. Are holly blue survival rates augmented by ants? That's a good question. Do they guard them? Uh, most of the blues do have relationships with, with, with ants. You're, it's absolutely true and a good question to ask. I've not heard of any relationship. The overpowering relationship is with the with the parasite. Um, yeah, good question. Thank you. Yeah, with skippers we covered last year. Uh, the, sim the simple rule: if it's got spots, it's a large skipper. Full stop. End of story. We also did uh, Essex Skipper last year. I won't bother with you there. These little chaps cause confusion because they're so flipping quick. 
uh, and they're dark. As I was saying uh, to Ricky about, uh, um, they are tricky when they're on in flight. They're just little little dark gray brown blobs just going at very high speed. Um, so I guess the only rule here is suspect it's a dingy skipper if it's very fast um, and just buzzes from place to place. They're territorial. They'll try and intercept other other butterflies, uh, but very quick. When the males are uh, are young, they're almost black with very distinct white spots. They're almost like a grizzled skipper. Uh, the females are much lighter in color. That's a that I think is a female. Yes, it is. The males generally have a long, thin body. Females have a fat, chubby body. We covered the Essex skipper uh, last year. The dis this distinctive feature is that not only the black dipped in ink, uh, which is the characteristic of the Essex skipper, but it's the, the distinction of the black with the pale on its antennae. As the butterfly ages, that difference disappears and it gets very, very difficult to tell apart. And you have to go to the second avenue of identify it, which is the Essex skipper has the male, has a very small, very short, you see them here, sex brand. That's the only way to tell. Uh, other things that are easily confused, and I see this a lot amongst even our experienced walkers, they get these, these three things confused. Ringlets, meta brands, and gatekeepers. So I thought I'd just spend a second and just run through. The most common confusion is the male meta brand, oops, and the ringlet. They're both black. That's the problem. They both got spots and they're both black. And when they're flying, and sometimes the only option it is to identify it when it's flying is say, oh, that's black. It must be a ringlet. No, don't take that as gospel. Take other factors as, as well. When it's flying, if you see any, any hint of color, brown, it will be a meta brown or a gatekeeper. While a ringlet only ever appears brown. You will never see any orange. And the reason is the underside of the male is black on top. The underside has an orange patch. And that shows when it's flying. It's quite subtle and you have to learn it. And the best way to learn it is to do it and just follow a couple when you're walking. But it's a very common mistake amongst it. And then people get this chap confused with that chap. So the female meadow brown, which is quite a big insect, you confuse with that chap. And the difference is size, but more critically, when they're flying, this appears a red brown, and that appears an orange brown. So the Dutch name for a gatekeeper is called the red fox because it's red. And that's the, oh, the color that you see when it's flying is this reddish orange, quite characteristic. So if it's small, reddish, it's almost inevitably gatekeeper. And just a last poke for day flying moss. Please, 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 can you uh, uh, please record day flying moss? There's just as many day flying moths as there are butterflies. They're equally as interesting. Uh, they're not too difficult to identify. Um, please take some time. Uh, the typical ones that people get confused, I get them confused, is the five spot and the six spot brunette. Um, and this picture shows the difference really, really well. Six spot is three pairs of three pairs of red dots. Five spots is a pair, a pair, and a blob. So if you see two on the end, it's a six. One on the end, it's a five. 
and it's usually the narrow border. We don't get the regular five spot. It's only those two species we see in, in Yorkshire. Very common uh, on our grassland sites. Not to be confused with a cinnabar, of course. I'm going to finish there uh, and unshare my screen. Um, and thank you, everybody, for attending. I hope it was of interest. We've covered an awful lot of ground. Um, and thank you very much for attending. And hope to see you again next year. Have a good, good season uh, and enjoy yourselves. Uh, last comment is uh, the Purple Emperor is here. It was seen for the first time in 2022. Um, keep your eyes out. I will be organizing a trip down to Sherwood Forest to see the main colony. Uh, some of the strongest colonies in the country now are in Sherwood Forest, which is literally five miles from Yorkshire. Uh, and we saw our first one in uh, near Sheffield last year. Um, I think the only thing we're lacking is sets of eyes. So look out for that one. And we'll see you all next year. Bye for now. Thank you.